Okay, we are, we are live. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Georg Bergner to uh, Dias. He was supposed to come last, well, earlier this year, but uh, other things took in, took over uh, Europe and the world. So uh, we're online at, at this point. Uh, Georg uh, has is a, almost a relative of Dias because his. Uh, PhD supervisor was Andreas Wiff, who was a close collaborator of Lachlan O'Rafferty. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome Jorik to, uh, to Dias. And he's going to tell us about supersymmetry in the lattice and results for N equals one supersymmetric Yang Mills. Please, Jorik, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. I mean, it's a pity that I cannot come in person um, because um, that would give us much more opportunity for some informal discussions also of ongoing work, et cetera. Yeah. So, but um, still it's, it's nice to present um, the, my recent results on supersymmetry on the lattice and n plus uh, one supersymmetry young mills theory. I will uh, do a more general overview, in fact, about supersymmetric young mills theory and simulations of supersymmetric gauge theories, numerical non perturbative simulations on the lattice. Um, and I will, so the main message will be basically that this is a three-step problem. First of all, you have to face a general problem of how to present supersymmetry on the lattice and to uh, have a good theory with a correct continuum limit that has intact supersymmetry. Um, the second uh, thing is are then theoret um, Practic additional practical challenges that you face if you want to simulate those theories. Um, so these are uh, involve rather technical complications uh, um, which make things in, in several respects more difficult than for other theories. I won't get, get there uh, into much detail. I will just um, show a little bit um, how the progress was with n equals one supersymmetric in this theory. And for this particular uh, theory, since uh, the theoretical problem of representing it correctly on the lattice and to fine tune it to the supersymmetric continuum limit can be solved for the theory, I will then also go to the third point, which is address relevant uh, questions for the theory um, and to try to formulate them in a, a way that you can handle it on the lattice and um, in, in order to get some new theoretical insights for the series. And in the last part of the talk, if there's enough time, I will also uh, explain a little bit how this can be generalized to a more general approach to supersymmetric gauge theories uh, in four dimensions. In lower dimensions, um, Danjo has, has quite some work on matrix model, for example. It's, it's much simpler. So I will focus on this more complicated cases and um, discuss there the, the general progress and also some applications. Um, so why do, does one want to study supersymmetry on the lattice? So the uh, main thing for doing lattice investigations, of course, that you want to have non-perturbative physics from first principles. So you want to um, have a, a direct um, handle on the low energy uh, properties just from the um, correct uh, ultraviolet theory. And this can, for, for these strongly interacting theories, only be done by numerical methods. Uh, the first motivation were, of course, some uh, beyond standard model scenarios where you have uh, non-perturbative su supersymmetry breaking induced. And this you need to, um, this, uh, in order to, to investigate these scenarios, you, you would need some non-perturbative methods. Then, of course, um, more recently are the other motivations, which are that we have a good handle on the theoretical properties of the supersymmetric theories, and we want to have a more general understanding of strongly interacting theories of QCD uh, and yang mills theory of the confinement problem. And therefore, we want to somehow deduce some lessons from these theories. Uh, 
from the supersymmetric theories and the, from the things that can be analytically calculated there. Um, this means that you have to deform also the theories and you need to have a, a more general tool and this would be uh, for example the, the lattice investigations and of course then it's also great gauge gravity duality uh, to extend and check the predictions of uh, that are derived due to this uh, gauge gravity duality on both sides um, but if you want to formulate a uh, supersymmetry on the lattice, you have, you have to face a, a general problem. And this can be stated, in fact, in terms of a no ghost uh, theorem that basically states that locality contradicts with supersymmetry. This is related to the breaking of, Leibniz, of the Leibniz rule of uh, differentiation for any discrete derivative operator that you need to have on, uh, for lattice formulation. Um, there are additional tech more technical problems uh, involved. For example, if you have fermions, you need to add an additional mass term to remove some doubling degrees of freedom. And this, these additional mass terms are not introduced for the bosons usually, and therefore you break supersymmetry in that case. And then there's also um, the fact that, for example, gauge links are represented differently from fermions on the lattice to respect gauge invariance, and this makes it difficult to uh, handle, um, to, to relate them with a the symmetry transformation. So therefore, you sometimes hear the quote from, from people who are working strongly with, with the lattice approach, that um, since the lattice is the only non-perturbative tool for um, having an interacting quantum field theory, and it cannot be combined with supersymmetry, there must be something wrong with supersymmetry. Um, now, one can have a look at other symmetries and um, try to find out what kind of uh, solutions have been found there. There's, for, for example, Cairo symmetry, where the, where the Nielsen-Nomia theorem uh, states, in fact, a similar thing, that locality contradicts with this uh, Cairo symmetry on the lattice. But there has been found a way out, which is a Ginsberg-Wilson relation. You can formulate a modified symmetry on the lattice, uh, which has a non-trivial right-hand side. D is a Dirac operator here, so it would be the, this red terms on the right-hand side would normally be zero. But you can have some modification that goes away with the continuum limit. A is the lattice spacing that goes to zero on the continuum limit. And therefore, you, um, you recover the full symmetry in the continuum limit. And this can be even shown um, with, um, with quantum corrections for this kind of uh, relations. So, and then, of course, for Cairo symmetry, the other solution is that you use fine tuning to recover the Cairo symmetry in the continuum limit. Um, the other example are space time symmetries. Um, these are also obviously broken if you have a discrete manifold. And, but in that case, a subgroup of the symmetry um, related to the rotations and um, so the discrete uh, transformations that are preserved, the subgroup of the space-time symmetries. Um, and this ensures that um, any kind of relevant breaking operators are um, disappear, are removed, uh, are not allowed to, due to this preserved subgroup. And this, in fact, um, is in line with one approach to supersymmetry on the lattice that will, I will if I have time, explain a little bit more in the end of the talk. But the other thing is that one can try first to find some solution similar to Cairo symmetry and find a modified symmetry relation. In fact, how is this, symmetry, how is this modified symmetry relation uh, derived? So as uh, Peter Hasenfratz, which has been a great uh, lattice, um, person who, who has put forward, brought forward the lattice investigations has put it always as that it's due to Mrs. Randomization Group and she's a good physics teacher and the, she teaches us how to realize symmetries on the lattice. So it's uh, related to the symmetry transformation is derived from a randomization group step from the continuum to the lattice. And that's how you can derive a remnant uh, of the symmetry that 
should be preserved on the lattice. If you generalize this approach, you can do it. And uh, we have successfully derived a symmetry relation for any kind of, of symmetry on, on the lattice. But uh, this gets a very, uh, this SL here is, um, is a lattice action. And then you have this MIJ here, which is basically a, the, con the symmetry transformation is a continuum. So the right hand side was, would be normally zero. That would be just the, the normal symmetry relation. But then you get a complicated uh, differential equation um, uh, on the right hand side that has to be fulfilled if you want to, to have this generalized um, Ginsburg-Wilson relation fulfilled on the lattice. And it's and still- it, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Again, is it linear in the, uh, the correction term, linear in uh, the lattice spacing so that it goes away in the continuum or is- Yes, yes. So, so this alpha basically encodes the, the regulator term that is introduced on the lattice this alpha to the minus one is goes away with the lattice spacing. This is encoded in this term. It's it's just here in a in a more general form, so to say. So you, um, I, I didn't have time to go into the details of the, of the derivation of this equation. Uh, what I just want to say is that um, there is some um, relation that you can derive, but it's um, it's still an open problem to find solutions of this equation. Um, so, yeah, because it's, uh, in general, you, you find that these are non-polynomial solution even that you get from this, so it's very complicated. It's as complicated as finding basically a perfect lattice action that is derived from a randomization group step of the continuum action. So it's not really um, that strange that these expressions become complicated. And your reference suggests that it's derived using the exact renormalization group? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so this can be derived, the relation can be derived to the, uh, using the renormalization group um, equation, but um, it's, um, the solutions are, um, apart from trivial examples, um, cannot be derived because then you would ha really have to solve the renormalization group equations if you want to find really non-trivial solution. In case of the, the Cairo symmetry, it's only so simple because um, the fermions only appear quadratically in the action and, um, the, um, and the gauge fields are basically spectators uh, for this symmetry and therefore you get such a simple relation. And in general, it, it becomes uh, too complicated. Okay. So the, the main uh, conclusion here is that we don't completely understand the lesson of, of Mrs. Randomization group here. So this Ginsberg-Wilson relation is, is not a solution in this case. So um, this means basically you, since there's no general solution in that respect, um, you have to go back to, to model dependent solution. And, um, here's a sketch of, uh, of several of these uh, solutions in terms of um, uh, just illustrated in terms of word identities. So you can either do fine tuning, um, which means that you basically accept the breaking at any finite letter spacing and that you tune the parameters according to the supersymmetric word identities in order to recover the full supersymmetry in the continuum mimic. Then you can have this, uh, so which is shown in the, in the second picture here uh, is basically a partial realization of supersymmetry. So you have one word identity that is realized, that is intact on the lattice. Um, it is zero and therefore uh, part of the supersymmetry are preserved and this um, reduces the fine tuning problem. And then you can also have, um, somehow live with a problem of known localities and then you can have the full supersymmetry on the lattice and this is the third word identity where both of these breaking terms basically vanish already at a finite lattice spacing. Um, but the problem is then that you have to prove that the theory still has a correct continuum limit. 
these are these examples here are shown for low dimensional theories so this is just one dimensional uh, supersymmetric um, Vestimino model and for low dimensional theories basically you can do all of these approaches because uh, you can sh you have a control um, on the breaking terms and you can uh, really show that that all of them produce a correct continuum limit. But for higher dimension, in particular for this, is, is uh, not possible. So this is basically what I want to say about this general problem of, of formulating supersymmetric theories on the lattice. Um, uh, however, there are particular examples where you can show that um, it's um, the fine-tuning problem can be solved or other approaches work. And one of these examples is N equals one supersymmetric young Mills theory. And this, um, and I want to, in the, in the following, to show a little bit how the simulations have been done for this theory and what kind of results we have achieved and how, why we are sure that we are now um, able to reproduce the correct supersymmetric continuum limit for this theory. So, um, first of all, the theory uh, basically is just a normal young Mills action with uh, supersymmetric partners, um, which are the gluinos, the, uh, which are Majorana fermions in the adjoint representation. One can introduce an additional mass term for these, but this would break supersymmetry softly. So uh, why is this particularly interesting? Of course, because it has been part of extensions of the standard model. And then, of course, then there have been also approaches to have a controlled confinement using supersymmetric Young-Mills theory by Insa, Jaffe, and Poppitz. And then there's also the connection of to QCD in the large n limit that has been derived by Amuni and Schiffman, which is uh, goes under the name of orientifold planar equivalence. Um, so one can ask whether it's, um, one can deduce anything from supersymmetric Gamble's theory uh, to, to recover, to, to get some insights into, into QCD. Um, now, the symmetries of the theory are first of all, of course, supersymmetry, which is softly broken by the Gluino mass term if one uh, doesn't set this to zero. Um, then there's also an, a sort of chirosymmetry, as one would tell it, and in case of, uh, call it in case of QCD, here it's usually called U1R symmetry. And in one flavor QCD, that would be completely broken by the anomaly, but in case of uh, supersymmetric uh, young Mills theory, because of the joint representation of the fermions, you have a remnant um, sym discrete symmetry, which uh, is intact, which is uh, Z2 and C. And this symmetry is then spontaneously broken by the Gluino uh, condensate to a Z2 symmetry. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Lambda is my own, no? Yes. So how can you have a transformation like this? Because it is not real. This Exponential minus i theta gamma five. Uh, it's well, no. You can you can have this. I mean, this is a Majorana, so it's a, it has it's it's a normal ordinary four components spinor. Yes, I'm but not it, sure. is it is you no. Know, it is invariant under the anti-linear involution, no. So this equation, I don't understand. Okay. It must, if it's Majorana, it must satisfy that it's uh, Dirac conjugate is equal to uh, it's Majorana conjugate. No, yes. size two, normally is charge. You need an antinuclear involution. Yeah. Normally, it's taken as the charge conjugation. So lambda c is equal to lambda. But this operator is not uh, real. It's a unitary operator. Unitary complex, it's unitary. I mean, well, uh, 
Yes, but um, so so this is. I mean, if if you have a Majorana representation, then these are real. But the the gamma five um, just relates the upper and lower parts of this. Um, uh, so so it acts differently on the upper and lower part. So the gamma five part is in fact um, consistent with the Majorana condition. But maybe we can discuss this um, afterwards. Um, okay. Not it looks difficult to satisfy. Hmm. Okay. Um, so how do we we realize this on the lattice? So um, basically, we we use a ordinary plaquette action. So you put the gauge feeds on the links, and then you um, have this kind of uh, form of. Um, so you have the smallest contours on the lattice, uh, and. These determine your plaquette operators. And then you have the, the Dirac-Wilson operator, which basically contains the gauge invariant transports and the joint representation for this Majorana fields. Um, and we do this with the um, simplest possible formulation, that is uh, the Wilson fermions. And uh, in order to, um, to get the correct representation of the degrees of freedom in the continuum, you need um, the uh, you need here you effectively introduce an additional mass term, and this is a problem with Wilson fermions that it breaks chiral symmetry. So you have an explicit for our lattice formulation, you have an explicit breaking of chiral symmetry and supersymmetry. And now the approach of fine tuning uh, is, of course, to add the uh, counter terms to the action and fine tune the coefficient uh, with respect to restoration of the symmetries. What has been shown theoretically um, uh, in the case of supersymmetric mill theory um, is that you only need uh, one parameter, which is the Gluino mass, to recover both super sym uh, both symmetries in the continuum limit. So to phrase this in, a, in another way, you have a chiral limit of the theory, and this is the same as, as the supersymmetric limit up to corrections that vanish with the lattice spacing. This also means if you have fulfilled the Ginsburg-Wilson relation, um, then you can uh, in fact do a simulation of the theory even without fine tuning because this relation ensures that Chiral symmetry is recovered in the continuum limit. Uh, so we have to tune this parameter or the kappa, which it goes with the inverse of the fermion mass. And this is done in our case. Uh, so we have done this using um, the adjoint pion mass, which is uh, a particle that appears only in the partially quenched. Uh, if you consider this theory as a partially quenched theory with a larger uh, fermion content, so it's not a really physical degree of freedom in, in supersymmetric Gamblis theory. But um, we have also cross-checked this with the supersymmetric water identity, so they, this leads basically to the same tuning. So what kind of, the first thing that you want to show is of course that supersymmetry is intact in our simulation and that we can recover the correct supersymmetric continuum limit. and what one can look at uh, in first place is a, a bound state spectrum of the series. Since there's confinement, you expect bound states, colorless bound state um, that form the low energy effective degrees of freedom here. And the simplest assumption for a low energy effective theory is of course that these form a chiral multiplet. Um, and suggestions for these chiral multiplets in the literature have been that you have either meson types uh, particles or they are also ca called gluino balls and uh, or gluino glue balls uh, and a gluino glue ball or you have uh, just glue ball states that form these kind of multiplets. Um, so the important thing is that they always consist of a scalar, a pseudo-scalar and a fermionic particle with the same mass. And what we want to check is in fact that um, we find this general multiplet formation and this gives us also a handle on the supersymmetry breaking at a finite lattice spacing. So, but in order to do this, we have to face the, the uh, 
technical problems of measuring these quantities and it's quite challenging user, uh, to get a signal for them because these co uh, correspond to flavor singlet mesons which are quite difficult to measure in also in QCD and uh, or blue ball states which are in most cases only measured precisely for quenched simulation so without fermions um, so therefore all of these are quite difficult to measure and then in addition you have this exotic particle which is cannot uh, be uh, in case of QCD or fermions in the fundamental representation which combines the gauge field and the um, Luino field together to one bound state, to one colorless bound state. Um, we have developed <coughs> the, um, the uh, tools for this measurement, but um, and even considered a mixing of the two multiplets um, in, in our latest lattice measurements. So something about the history, it, um, the, we have found already that we uh, can determine a multiplet formation for SU2 uh, young mills theory and our most recent results also refers to SU3 super young mills theory which is more uh, demanding because of the joint representation has larger matrices and this is uh, it's a larger numerical effort to simulate them. Um, but we have finally succeeded and I will present uh, the results here. There's also, uh, one has to note that you need quite challenging methods. For example, you have to, the, the fact that you have, if you integrate out the Majorana fermions, you get a Fafian and this Fafian on the lattice has, uh, can have negative signs. So you need to get a handle on this Fafian signs. If you want, I can explain a little bit of this technical details also in the end, uh, if there are questions. Does it mean you have to reweight? Is it reweighting you're referring to there? Yes, you, you, you have in principle to reweight, but it's a rather mild sign problem because it vanishes in the continuum limit. Okay. Um, so this is what, what we got. Uh, so you need quite a large number of simulations. So this beta refers to the inverse of the um, gauge coupling squared um, and larger beta correspond to smaller lattice spacing uh, in such a theory where you have asymptotic freedom and um, then you uh, this um, on the x-axis here is some measurement of the um, of how far you are away from the chiral limit so of the remnant gluino mass and you see that you can extrapolate uh, quite nicely to the chiral limit, but uh, at coarse lattices or small beta, the, there's a gap between the cons uh, constituents of the spectrum and this gap closes if you move uh, to smaller lattice spacings. This is first a good thing to observe. Um, and then we finally even succeeded in a complete continuum extrapolation of the theory. So. This is. How large a lattice do you work with? So um, these are up to 24 cr cross 48, 4 cube no. cross 48. Mm -hmm. So it's not. Um, and how do you do your simulations? Uh, are you going to tell us about that later or uh, what, you, what kind of algorithms do you use? Uh, I can tell you uh, a lot of things there, but I. From this overview talk, I have basically excluded a lot of these details. So okay. and to make it short, you need to use the RHMC algorithm to simulate it because you have this. What is that called again? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't the rational that. hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because you have this, um, the problem that you need to somehow um, mimic the Pfaffian, which is the square root of the determinant yes. um, up to a sign. Pro, a sign. The sign is, is determined afterwards and included via reweighting, and the the simulation just need to some uh, to have a rational approximation of the square root of the determinant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and this is this is the way how how we did this. So so it's a quite a, a large, even though the lattices are not so large, um, the um, 
the um, amount of computing time is quite huge for the simulations um, because also you need a lot of data points for the final continuum extrapolation. Uh, luckily, we have tested the finite volume effects and these are quite small, which is compared to QCD, which is, I think, due to the fact that the pions are not really contributing. So you don't have this very light degrees of freedom uh, actively um, participating in this in this theory. So are these supersymmetric things somehow easier to, to simulate? I would think they'd be harder, but... Yeah, no, they are harder. They are harder, yeah. but you... But you, the, the volumes, you don't need as large volumes. It seems that from our estimates, it's a finite volume effects are smaller. This I is see, that's what I was uh, picking up on. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. And what, what, is the global mass larger? Um, the global mass... Um, so, so it, it, this is difficult to compare because you you have to fix somehow the the units and. Well, if I just turn the if I take the same model without uh, the fermions and I include the fermions, I can compare so, the global mass in. So I would say they cases. they are they is, it it goes a little bit down, but I'm yeah I'm not sure. Then it's very surprising that the uh, that the finite volume would be smaller. No, I mean the the for QCD the main effect doesn't come from the glue balls; it comes from the pions. The pions are the lightest state. Oh, the light, they would be yes. Yeah, and and here you you don't have the pions uh, in the game. Then we yeah, but that uh, that's why I wanted to compare. The, you the pions are only in the game when I include uh, um, fundamental fermions. So I shouldn't, for a fair comparison, I shouldn't include fundamental fermions. I should only compare with yeah, pure gauge yeah, yeah. theory. With pure gauge theory, I think they are comparable. Okay, then that's really the only fair comparison. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Okay, and um, here's just a summary of, of this final result. So you see it already uh, in the picture that uh, you, you observe uh, uh, restoration of this degeneracy of the multiplet in the continuum limit. And we have also seen that you see the same thing for the ward identities, that you have a recovery of supersymmetry in the continuum limit. Um, so this is quite nice because, so it, it basically tells you two things that first of all, um, Supersymmetry on the lattice uh, seems to be realized even quite non-trivially in this uh, in this bound state um, at low energies, but it also tells you that that there is no like kind of unexpected um, supersymmetry breaking uh, effect due to the non-perturbative dynamics here. Um, and Therefore, one can try to address now some, also some other properties and other relative, uh, relevant questions that can be investigated for the theory. And one additional non-perturbative question is, of course, what happens to the phase transition um, in supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. And there one um, first have to see what kind of phase transitions appear there. Uh, in QCD, you have um, basically only uh, one crossover that you can observe because um, you have deconfinement uh, phase transition, which is related to, to center symmetry um, breaking, uh, to the, to the um, center symmetry. And this, but the center symmetry is broken by the fermions in the fundamental representation, and therefore you don't have um, a real phase transition in this case in the uh, realistic QCD model. And then you have chirosymmetry, but again, this chirosymmetry is broken by the fermion mass, so you, you have for both transitions only a crossover, and you can now, it's, it's hard to say anything about uh, the relation between these two symmetries. Um, 
for supersymmetry, for supersymmetric Yamla theory, on the other hand, the good thing is that you have center symmetry and that you have chiro uh, symmetry in the, of course, only if you switch off the, the soft supersymmetry breaking Aguino mass. So you have, in principle, two independent transitions that can happen in supersymmetric Yamla theory. And the fact is now much more interesting than in QCD whether there's any kind of relation between the two transitions. So concerning the, the expectations, so the theoretical background there is that you can derive um, a constraint from, from Toft anomaly matching that the deconfinement transition should be lower than the, um, than the Cairo transition. And then there are also some conjectures which are more, um, yeah, so, so only conjectures, no precise statements about supersymmetric Gamblers theory, which rather indicate that there should be the same, uh, the, the deconfinement and chiral uh, transition should be the same in supersymmetric Gamblers theory. But this um, is quite uh, in contradiction which, uh, with what ha has been found in its investigations of, um, a, John, of um, a theory with two a joint Dirac fermions um, on the lattice. So in the first investigation, even a huge difference between deconfinement and Cairo transition were found. Later investigation found that there was a factor of basically eight uh, difference, uh, higher Cairo transition than the deconfinement transition. The problem with, uh, with these investigations, however, is that the systematics are not really under control because other lattice studies have found that this the same theory should most likely be a, a conformal theory. So you, you basically don't have even a, a chiral transition in, in the usual sense here. And uh, therefore, there's a big question mark, of course, behind uh, these kind of investigations. Do these authors identify a mechanism that would, dis that a physical mechanism to distinguish these two different temperatures? Um, basically, they, th this is a measurement. Um, there are some, some also perturbative arguments in this works, but um, I, um, I have not seen a, a clear mechanism that's behind mm. this yeah. in this Thank works. You. And it must also be said that uh, the signal for the Cairo transition is not really pronounced in this investigation. So for this reason, we, we have um, investigated the same thing for, um, for supersymmetric Gamblers theories. And, and in that case, we found that at least such a large difference is not observed. They are more or less, the, here are shown the susceptibilities for the Polyakov loop, which is the indication of the deconfinement transition and the chiral condensate. And you see that basically they appear both at the same temperatures. So T series here refers to the um, de deconfinement transition and you, um, and therefore, um, up to our precision, this, uh, this is in consistent, uh, consistent with this agreement. Um, yeah. So we, we were able to, to resolve also the, um, we'll compare this also with the pure this case where you have, I mean, it's, it's up to, to, of course, the ambiguity of scale setting here that you have uh, can compare the two transition temperatures and uh, that you get basically a lower transition temperature due to the influence of the fermions, which is kind of expected. Sorry, you've quoted a ratio there, there of the two, but is, are there, I mean, are the errors look like they are large enough to say there are genuinely two transitions here? Sorry? But Sorry. Can, I'm just wondering if you can be sure that there are two separate transitions or if the chiral symmetry breaks with the deconfinement in this model. There's just one phase transition. Yeah, we are, this is only one phase transition and this comparison here below is to pure young nodes. Oh, I see, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So, okay. 
So, so in our simulations, we found that that within the current position, the both transitions agree, which is in line okay. with these conjectures about the theory, but uh, in contradictions with uh, these uh, estimates or this earlier uh, lattice right. investigation okay. for the two flavor case. And to measure the chiral susceptibility, what are you actually measuring? You're measuring the um, the lambda bar lambda. Uh, the fluctuations. Yes, so, of, so of basically, that. basically, what you have to calculate is the second derivative with respect to the mass. But yeah, we okay. consider here only the the disconnected part from this because uh, the the other part basically contains doesn't contain the the information about the phase transition. Well, the, the, the disconnect. Uh, you, sorry, you connect. You only consider the connected part. Is that what you said? The, the disconnected part, so so the condensate, uh, the square of the, because you you have also connected fermions lines then this between the two condensates. Okay, I see what you're Yeah, so it's, not, it's not really a susceptibility then. <laughs> well, we have also measured the other part, and we can show that it doesn't contain any signal uh, for the for the phase transition. So in the paper, you can find also the other part. Um, okay, and um, so this is one special thing that you can investigate for supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, and that um, is quite a non-trivial statement um, because it it relates to the two basic um, phase transitions that occur for for these strongly interacting theories in general. Um, then so I just so I to be <laughs> putting into it. I, it's just the square of the order parameter, isn't that what it is? Yes. Okay. Right. This is what. Yeah. Um, and so the one other uh, quite uh, thing that is quite different from from QCD is that you can basically uh, turn off the deconfinement uh, by changing the, the fermionic boundary conditions. So in the thermal theory, you have antiperiodic boundary conditions for the fermions, just to the different statistics. And um, if you turn this to periodic boundary conditions, you go from what is called the thermal ensemble, you go to the, the Witten index. Um, because of the, you introduce just a minus one operator for the, for the fermions. And what can, has been shown or already earlier is that this is basically invariant under continuous changes of the of the parameter, this Witten index, and therefore it's basically independent of the radius. So if you expect when if you if you go to this ensemble with uh, periodic boundary conditions, you can since basically temperature comp uh, um, one over the temperature. Uh, corresponds to a compactified, uh, to a, the circle of a compactified directions, you can basically shrink this radius to arbitrary small uh, radius, and then you enter a regime where you can do a reliable semi-classical analysis of this problem. And so you can investigate the, the theory in, in uh, analytically in this more radius regime. And th this has been done by <coughs> yeah, um, several authors and there's uh, quite um, a huge um, in investigation there in the theoretical community about this. And then there has been always a conjecture that from this, this semi-classical regime, there's a kind of continuity towards the deconfinement transition in, in the ordinary young mills theory if you increase the fermion mass and that you can somehow learn something about the relevant degrees of freedom in the semi-classical analysis um, also for the for the transition in in the young mills case and this is why we also wanted to study this and in, in order to see what how this can be extended but first of all you have to see whether you can uh, really prove this um, uh, this absence of the deconfinement transition also in in the lattice investigation, and this is what is shown here. Basically, 
what you see is um, this blue curve curves correspond to the um, smallest masses and the you of course see first that for the Polyakov loop the signal uh, the order parameter of the deconfinement transition you see a drastic change if you change the boundary conditions and for the lowest masses the blue curves you see in fact that you, these are and with periodic boundary condition it's almost constant so you really see an absence of the deconfinement transition you can uh, also look at other quantities to to further uh, to have some further uh, uh, arguments for that but if for larger masses you see in fact something different and you see um, that there's an intermediate phase and you can even identify their three phases. So first you have a confined phase, then you have a deconfined phase, and then something that one would call a reconfined phase. Um, and this corresponds to such a phase diagram. So you would have um, this light gray area is something that is only uh, deconfined with thermal boundary conditions, and then this uh, shape darker shaded area here is something that is deconfined with periodic and with uh, the thermal boundary conditions. And um, this is a little bit different from the, um, from the expectation from theory, but we have been able to trace this back to, the, to some lattice artifacts that you have at, at very small radius. So at very small radius, um, you reach a regime where you test higher and higher energy scales so you come into the re and if you come to the region of the cutoff then of course you get some modifications and for Wilson fermions this introduces some stronger um, confining effects in this small circle regime and therefore you get uh, something down uh, here so you have to be make sure that in order to really match this to the analytic predictions you have to make sure that you um, that you go also consider also the continuum limit, but the main effect that you uh, get an absence of the um, conf uh, of the deconfinement transition and that you can go to a small circle regime. This is also true on the lattice, so you can now, uh, which we want to do in the future, also trace back, try to, to match more of the semi-classical analysis to the lattice investigations. Okay, so this, um, with this I want to close the, basically the topic of N equals one supersymmetric young Mills theory. Um, so as I've shown, this theory can be reliably simulated on the lattice and there are interest even a further non-trivial question that can be addressed with the non-perturbative methods uh, like the phase transitions. So uh, I want to understand if I go back, yes, this, this thermal uh, boundary condition where you see deconfinement, so is that, I didn't quite understand, it. is that supposed to be a lattice artifact or, or is that going to be really there? Uh, so so the, um, this thermal deconfinement transition here, this is not a lattice artifact. What is a lattice artifact is basically what you get at, at a very small radius, which comes close to the lattice cutoff, which is down here, but it's, it's not. Um, so if you, if you would then do the same thing, uh, try to match also with thermal boundary conditions, if you would try to match uh, the continuum perturbation theory, um, this thermal perturbation theory that you can, might be able to do here um, with the lattice results, then you also have to be careful because the, the lattice artifacts play a, an important role then here. So yeah. one has to, to be careful to go to very low radius. It's just the reason why the, with the periodic boundary conditions, we do not reproduce completely this contour even down to, to the radius go, going to zero. So one needs some intermediate region to match the semi-classics um, with the lattice. This is basically the conclusions from this uh, that one can draw from this uh, graph. Okay. 
Any further question? Okay, then I just now uh, the last topic, basically I want to give a more general overview of what uh, one can do uh, to simulate 4D supersymmetric H theories um, on the lattice. Um, so what one uh, can see basically for any corresponding super young mist theory is that the tuning approach of the Guino mass uh, works. And now one, if one can try to generalize this approach. So one uh, introduces due to the breaking of supersymmetry on the lattice um, relevant uh, terms that need to be compensated by counting terms uh, counter terms and these have to be tuned um, to get the correct continuum limit. Now, if you want to go away from super, n equals one super young mist theory, the let, next obvious uh, generalization would be supersymmetric QCD, which means you combine n equals one super young mist theory with a matter of superfield, which are quarks and squawks, um, and but this introduces uh, with the quarks scalar degrees of freedom in the theory. Um, the Lagrangian looks quite complicated. It is written down here. So you get the usual terms for the, for the scalars and, and fermion terms, basically. But the, in addition, you get also quite complicated Yukawa interactions, which combine two fermions in two different representations. So you have the Majorana fermions in the adjoint representation coupled to the Dirac fermions in the fundamental representation in quite a non-trivial way. So it's, uh, it's technical, quite difficult to simulate the theory, but in addition, you have also a problem with the scalar fields because these, um, these introduce, um, there are a lot of terms that you can construct from the scalar fields which are not forbidden by the symmetries. So yeah, why one wants to consider this is basically one can study um, the, um, for example, the conjectures by Seiberg, if one is able to simulate this um, by studying the NF and um, number, number of flavors and number of colors, uh, the phase diagram with, with respect to number of flavors and number of col colors. And um, this, Kind of Sorry, a, just just to clarify, the model you're talking about, if in f is equal to two in c, is that that's the case that's conformal? Is that the model we're talking about? Uh, well, he the the conformal is, is is this infrared fixed point here that is mentioned. So you have the three half and c uh, limit on on the number of flavors. So number of flavors refers here to the matter fields. Uh, yes, the fundamental, your fundamental representation and you have a joint representation. Yes, and the NF corresponds and, to the fundamental, um, so to the matter multiplet. So you need, yes. need to add uh, as much scalar fields um, as fermions. Yes, I mean, I, I'm just thinking that there, that if I am in that particular case, uh, I have uh, um, the theory is really to be finite. So there are no ultraviolet divergences, very similar to n equals four supersymmetry gang mills. It, this is the same model, is it? Um, it's 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 supersymmetric QCD. So it's not n equals two super young mills, and it's not n. It's n equals one. Yes, it's n equals one super uh, super QCD. Yeah. Okay. It must be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, so, so I, I just know these, these conjectures by, by Zyberg and these, um, one can try to study this, uh, the phase diagram, if one can consider the, the, uh, dependence on the number of flavors. Um, but the simulations are quite, um, difficult here. Excuse me. Can I go back to that? Uh, so, so if you have too many, uh, flavors, then, then you, then you're, uh, don't, you lose confinement. Uh, okay. yes. And then you, uh, even uh, more. Too many fermions. Yeah. Too many couple of fermions, right? Yes. So, so there's a, so if you, 
basically if you are uh, at the lower end, so I, I've written here this in, in this point, infrared fixed point, the range where a conformal, so-called conformal window is, is expected for this theory. And th therefore you lose uh, confinement. Yes, in that range, I lose confinement. And if I'm going over the upper limit of this uh, window, I even lose asymptotic freedom. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Why there's a, there's a, that, that's been known for a while, right? Uh, that you lose it after, uh, I don't know, I, I used to yeah, yeah. hear that I a mean, long time yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. Uh, but it would be a good thing to, to consider this series also on the lattice. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, in particular um, to study, um, I mean, the, the, the interesting theories there would be rather to, to the lower end of this uh, conformal mm -hmm. window. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, or even be just below the conformal window. Um, yeah, so now the the problem is that you have to face a large tuning problem so instead of one parameter you have at least six um additional terms and this comes um from the from the additional scalar fields these are not much there's not much constraints um on these if you don't have supersymmetry you get a, a lot of terms that you can construct from these fields um, which are all, all allowed and, and possibly relevant. If you use ginzburg wilson fermions, which means you have chiral symmetry um, restored, you can show that um, this reduces to, to at least six parameters, which is much more challenging, of course. Then the Papian um, can become complex, but you have the bosonic symmetry, which um, leads to some uh, cancellations at least for certain observables in this uh, complex um, in the in case of this complex Pfaffian and then the other question is of course how do you extrapolate then the, the chiral limit in this case um, which uh, is of course very difficult if you have uh, a small number of uh, flavors then uh, the prediction of Seiberg is basically that there's an unstable vacuum. So you have a, even a runaway of this uh, scalar fields. Then you have uh, at larger flavors, you are inside the, the conformal window, which has additional uh, complications for the lattice simulations due to large uh, finite volume effects. So the most interesting cases are uh, just at the lower end of this conformal window, most likely. Yeah, I mean, um, we have been working to, towards this direction, um, towards an investigation of, of this theory. And um, so we have, uh, for example, investigated a mixed fundamental adjoint uh, theory with two different representations for the fermions. And we have also implemented this uh, complicated Yukawa coupling terms and, and then simulations with it. Uh, and the tuning problem um, is, is now the most difficult part, which has already been uh, investigated by some authors um, in the perturbative limit, which might already give some, some hints on how to do this. But this is work in progress and it, it might need quite a lot of additional investigations. And similar things are in fact true for N equals two super young mills theory. Um, which has a similar um, kind of tuning problem. Um, but um, if you go, if you go to further to the models with extended supersymmetry, the next uh, very interesting candidate is N equals four supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, which basically can be seen as a reduction of N equals one supersymmetric Young-Mills theory from uh, in ten dimensions. So um, you have, uh, in that case, uh, for Majorana fermions, you get additional um, scalar fields um, as well. So um, if you do a very uh, a naive formulation on the lattice with these fields, you get um, the same problems as basically for, for super QCD because a lot of counterterms can appear. 
and um, these scalar terms are basically remnants of the of the gauge fields in the in the higher dimensions that come from the dimensional reduction. And then you you have in it um, also, which is also the case for n equals two superangular theory, um, you have this um, uh, a bosonic potential with flat directions, which also uh, introduces some problems in, in practical simulations. So naively, one one uh, um, would think that that uh, despite the fact that this theory has been considered for gauge gravity duality and string theory and is therefore a quite interesting candidate for non perturbative in investigations on the lattice, um, that uh, due to the large uh, supersymmetry, you would need a lot of fine tuning. But in that case, however, um, the good thing is that the additional supersymmetry um, allows to preserve a subgroup of the symmetry on the lattice. And this is similar to what I've said about space-time symmetries. This constrains the number of possible counter terms. Um, yeah, one can illustrate the construction a little bit with a, with it, uh, within uh, with a formulation in in two dimensions, but I I will basically basically uh, you you combine the the flavor symmetry or the R symmetry with the symmetries of space time to preserve a certain subgroup of this symmetry um, on the lattice and in two dimensions this is quite natural to do this um, uh, because you can decompose then the um, supercharges according to um, this representation and you find that there's a certain scalar component um, and the scalar pro component is does not interplay with the symmetries of space-time and th therefore it can be preserved even um, on the lattice where the space-time symmetries become discrete. Um, and but I, due to the uh, now um, so the lack of time, I will just um, skip this this discussion, the more details about this discussion, and basically only say that the same can be done then also for the um, uh, n equals four superimposed theory in, in four dimension, where you have the um, um, the R symmetry of this theory and the Lorentz group, and you can choose a certain diagonal part of these two symmetries that you can preserve on the lattice. Um, uh, th that you can choose to, to preserve a part of the supersymmetries on the lattice. And um, what this leads to a, a quite complex formulation. So you have gauge fields, which uh, also or include some kind of uh, degrees of freedom from the scalar fields uh, and therefore become complex. Um, and then you have um, also a, a different representation of the lattice, uh, of the fermions on the lattice. So you have side fermions and then link fermions and then also plaquette fermions. Um, and this, uh, as you see already from the fact that they are side fermions is, uh, is the fact that also for the supercharges, a similar decomposition uh, would lead to uh, preserve a part that can be preserved on the lattice because it's uh, it acts only local. And the lattice structure, you also have to, to choose a, a different lattice structure with five basis vectors uh, in, in four dimensions, which leads to a, a quite difficult formulation. But what you can show is that this reduces your fine tuning and in fact, it has been shown in, in perturbation theory that you don't need um, uh, a specific fine tuning for this theory. Um, however, if you simulate such a theory on the lattice, then of course you might ask what is even the, the definition of the continuum limit where you get supersymmetry restoration and all kinds of lattice artifacts have to go away. Because uh, in the continuum, you know that the beta function vanishes, so you don't have this ordinary arguments like in QCD where you have asymptotic freedom and you know how th that you have to study the theory basically related to the to a Gaussian fixed point. 
and um, therefore it's it's good to study some of the randomization group properties and i will show you some things i've done uh, so that david shake and and i've done concerning the the anomalous uh, mass anomalous dimension determined from the mode number of, which means um, the you take the spectrum, the lowest eigenvalue spectrum of the Dirac operator, you integrate it up to a certain scale, and therefore you, from this scale you can uh, get a scale-dependent uh, mass arms dimension. And we have investigated this for different values of the gauge coupling lambda, that is called lambda here. And what you can see is basically that you get uh, uh, quite a good agreement with the expectation that you have a uh, zero mass arms dimension, but for larger couplings, it becomes more and more difficult to reach far enough to the infrared to to really see the the restoration of this uh, to to really get the the regime where you have this um, this mass arm, effective mass arms dimension zero, which is expected in the continuum. So it's uh, so you seem to get to the correct continuum limit but you have to worry about whether you get the correct scales uh, in your theory for larger coupling and there are some further challenges with the simulations like that there's a complex Fafian and uh, which makes it difficult to go to larger couplings and also you need to stay think about stabilizing simulations I put you some references about this um, recent uh, investigations in that respect. So to summarize, um, I, what I've shown is basically that there's first of all a theoretical problem with uh, formulating supersymmetric theories on the, the on, on the lattice, which is in some aspects uh, still unsolved. Um, then there's um, concerning the n equals one supersymmetric gamma theory, I've shown that you can really do decent simulations and you get the phase diagram and can investigate other non-trivial properties of the theories. Then for n equals four super angles theory, I've shown that there's also a, a, a decent approach, um, but there are of course other um, challenges which are rather on the technical side, like to go to larger simulations to stabilize the simulations with respect to some remnants of the flat directions. And then um, there are still open challenges and this is supersymmetric QCD and N equals uh, two supersymmetric numbers theory. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I was just difficulty getting my on mute there. <laughs> Um, thanks very much for a nice talk. Um, and the, the floor is open to questions. Sorry. I just have a general question. So when you when you have all these uh, fermions uh, or Grassmann variables uh, around, do you, uh, you you typically trace them out and and then have to worry about the resolving Fafian? Is that right? Yes. Yes. I mean, in, in a simulation, you have to integrate them out. And then you have what you have to introduce uh, in a, uh, ordinary simulations uh, is you have to introduce pseudo fermions. So basically you introduce bosonic fields that um, are combined with the inverse of the matrix. Mm -hmm. The inverse is squared and then you, you need to, to approximate for the Papian the fourth root of this squared matrix in terms of a rational or a polynomial approximation. This is how fermions are, are yeah. handled. And you need yeah. to calculate the phase separately and, yeah. and reweight. Yeah, you have to calculate the phase separately. And in theories where you're, for n equals four superior theories at, at larger couplings, this is challenging because there you, you have to consider all kinds of, of contributions there. For the case of, um, of super and list theory, I mean, I can show you maybe, so you, you integrate out the, the functions 
yes. uh, the, the fermionic fields, then you get the Pfaffian and you can trace this back to the number of um, the generate real eigenvalue pairs. Um, and and the number of negative real degenerate eigenvalue pairs that you measure for the Dirac operator. Mm. Uh, this is a, a, a longer argument because there's no direct relation between the, the eigenvalues and the, the Pfaffian. It's only that if there's a zero eigenvalue that you can relate um, because of this relation between square root of determinant and Pfaffian, you can relate this to the eigenvalues. Um, but in, in this case, you can really trace this back and then you have to measure this uh, eigenvalue spectrum. Here's an example of where you have real and imaginary part of this eigenvalues of the Dirac operator and then you determine this uh, number of uh, real eigenvalues and in most cases you see that you basically um, if you are close enough to the continuum limit you don't observe uh, you mainly don't observe any negative um, Fafians because you know that in the continuum limit you can show that uh, you get a positive uh, Fafian. It's only a lattice artifact in Subiangmus theory. For n equals four supersymmetric Young Mills theory, it's it's more difficult because there um, somehow this Pfaffian sign is scattered. Um, the information is more scattered in, in all of the eigenvalues of the, of the matrix, and there you really have to do complicated relating. Um, and then, of course, there are other formulations that you can use in lower dimensions, which are related to, to what's called warm algorithms um, for representation of fermions, um, which, are, which uh, can so help to solve these kind of, of problems. Just uh, Bal uh, Chandler has to go, but you have some one comment on uh the by your own, um, the chiral transformation well do you want to make it uh, i think i sorted it out i think but i don't know what it is well in the uh, if i look at wild fermions okay, it's much easier uh, then in the uh, uh, minkowski space the representation of the wild fermion is half zero with regard to sl2c okay? yes so, yeah. so you can change and you can write the standard action and you can change its phase by exponential i theta and that is the chiral transformation is in fact helicity for a free particle the transformation with regard to the helicity okay. now i can assemble them into myrana by taking the half zero and uh, the complex uh, charge conjugation half zero which is zero half into a column then yep. the Chiral transformation acts as cos theta psi theta minus sin theta cos theta. It's a real representation. So reality is maintained. Now, I think a similar thing must be happening when one goes to the Euclidean case. But in Euclidean case, there is a doubling already, no? Because... Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the problem is, so, so the reality is lost if you go, the, this, you cannot really uh, talk about this the same reality constraint as in the, in the Minkowski space for yes, but for what Majorana you Fermion. So you can talk about the symmetry of the Dirac operator still, but you uh, you cannot really um, make such a so there's no Majorana representation. So my confusion is still I think it's so okay in the Euclidean case the half zero and zero half are not complex conjugate of each other. You have a half zero because it is so four. Okay? Yeah. So you have a standard doubling. You have, if you write it in the uh, two component notation, there's a standard doubling. There is another fermion you have to introduce to make a Hamiltonian and Lagrangian. Okay? I think in the real case, you have an SO4 transformation, but I don't see is there should be some SO2 sitting there. Okay, which is uh, somehow rotating between the fermions. I don't know what it is, but it, there must be one. Because in the uh, uh, wild form, there is two component form, I can see that there is a Q1 transformation. 
which acts on both the fermions, the both the chiral, I mean, the two chiral parties, partners uh, in the appropriate phase. Okay? So it should be yeah. there. I think. Uh, one more remark, which is in the, there is a Wittel anomaly, you know, in the SU2 gay series. Okay? Yeah. Namely, there is a the, the half change changes sign. Okay? Because um, if you have a uh, half, but the pi 4 of SU2, pi 4 of S3 is Z2. And that changes, because of that, there is a change of sign of the half n. If you try to make a chiral gauge theory of SU2 fermions. So, um, what is SU2? Okay? Yeah. I, this is a bit anomaly that we know. It should, I suppose it is not here because that uh, pi 4 is there. The loop group of maps of S3 into the gate group is probably trivial. I don't know. So, because you said that uh, there's no change of sign in the continuum. Yeah, but, but uh, this is, I mean, the, the this is Miss Majorana fermion, so you, you don't have a. Um, it, it's, it's a different theory, I think. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I have to leave. Unfortunately, I have to leave now. Okay. But I enjoyed the talk very much. It was very nice. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Right. I'll talk to Simon and tell him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, also, I know Joseph, whom you also you quoted. I'll tell them. Yes, Simon, of course. It's a, <laughs> yeah. a close collaborator. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Bye. That's Simon Catterall. The reference is to Simon Catterall for those that yeah, don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, I would not. Not everyone would, you say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, I'm just curious about the uh, n equals four uh, work that you were talking about. I mean, I guess there, there's some. Isn't there some uh, idea that these things are um, essentially integrable or, or, or not? In other words, I mean, people are using some kind of, uh, well, maybe only in the large M, maybe on the only yeah, yeah. number of flavor I, limit. I think, um, yeah, it's, only in that, the, it's only in that limit. Yeah. I think one of the reasons is, to, uh, is to study even, uh, the corrections that appear to this, to this larger N, N C limit. Yeah. I did that. They don't know how to do that, I guess. Right. Or yeah. So, so this is one thing that that one can investigate here. Yes. Well, I suppose. Well, in in another sense, you are forced to deal with them since you are going to work with finite n and a rather small n. Yeah. 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 Of yeah. course. Of course. Uh, I mean, then it's a question how large n you have to to take in order mm -hmm. to make contact then to the larger n limit and so on. This is all difficult. Yeah. How large an n has have people worked? So well, you've done SU two and SU three probably. Uh, Maybe yes. SU four. SU four is what I what I've considered for this mm -hmm. smaller project uh, with David. Um, yeah, but I think also larger, a little bit larger NF uh, NC have been uh, considered uh, uh, in the in the simulations. But of course, um, yeah. So, I mean, so it, you said everything is much easier, in, and of course it would be in lower dimensions. Is there, uh, are, are there issues that, that you can understand uh, via numerical simulations which are not accessible by, uh, uh, by, by theory, for example, by sort of well-known theory? I mean, uh, in lower dimension, there are still the the um, there are still theories um, like the BMN and BFSS uh, models. Yeah. There are this matrix models that you can you can connect to the gauge gravity. Um, yes, I, I guess Denjo has done some work on that, right? Denjo. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. and uh, I mean, I I'm also working in a separate project of, uh, about these. So and that then, still requires some numerical understanding, I suppose, to get a complete picture. Yes, yes. I mean, the the problem is that you need to to understand the complete uh, phase diagram, so to say, 
not only in the in the limiting cases. So you know the the uh, very strongly coupled and very weakly coupled limit, and then you have to find somehow a connection between the two limits. Um, and and that that's not accessible by uh, by perturbative or other sort of techniques. No. Yeah. Presumably, yeah. need lattice gauge theories then to or some kind of simulation to. Yes. to uh, probe those type of questions. Yeah. Or, some, or some very creative theorist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, this is, this, these are the, the main goals to, that are addressed in the simulations of this low dimensional theories, uh, which have its own, their own problems. I mean, you, you know that you can deal with the supersymmetry breaking in that case, but still there are problems related basically to flat directions as well. Yeah, you have the uh, flat and, directions, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then also um, these, uh, in order to stabilize them, you need to go to large n limit, and then, um, yeah, things become again very expensive um, as well, but due to 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 much different reason. So this is basically. Um, what you have face have to face there, but uh, of course uh, the the precision uh, for the statements there are much better than if you just look at any plus four in, in four yeah. dimension. Very good. Are there other questions? Or we maybe I'll. Thank uh, Georg and stop the recording and we can be less formal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for a very nice yeah, time. Wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.